Good morning. Uh, welcome to the ACOM seminar. Uh, we're pleased to have Louisa Ammons speaking today. Louisa is a scientist three in ACOM. She received her bachelor's degree at Haverford College and her PhD at SUNY Stony Brook, during which time I happen to know she went to Antarctica several times to measure the ozone hole, which is where she and I met when we were both grad students. Um, her interests in research lie in the integra integration of, of models and measurements to investigate the sources and um, their chemical uh, impacts of sources and their chemical evolution and tropospheric composition. Uh, she played a key role in the development of Mozart IV, the chemistry model that's now used in CESM. Uh, she maintains real-time forecasts of uh, species like ozone, carbon monoxide, and other compounds that are uh, provided to the community. She's currently the, the co-chair of the CESM Chemistry Climate Working Group and leads the development of CAM-CHEM, where she's uh, particularly interested in the representation of volatile organic carbon oxidation. She's been active in NCAR-led field campaigns such as Topsy, Mirage, DC-3, Nomads, and Frappe, assisting with flight planning during the campaign and post-mission analysis. In addition, as I believe she's gonna talk about, uh, she successfully uh, proposed to provide flight, uh, forecasting and flight planning to uh, several NASA field campaigns, most recently, uh, Koros AQ, the recent joint Korean-US air quality study in Korea. Welcome, Louisa. Thank you, Mike. Yes, as Mike said, I will talk about Korea. Um, this is a picture of uh, Seoul, Han River, on a particularly smoggy day. Um, but first, I want to uh, introduce some of the uh, ideas behind um, studying uh, air pollution, uh, air, air quality, and predicting it. So air pollution hazards consist of ozone, um, oxidants, various toxics, fine and ultrafine particles, and they primarily come from anthropogenic emis emissions and are intensified often by heat waves and uh, stagnation events, as well as um, extreme events from, such as wildfires and gas leaks. And ozone and particulates are particularly a threat to uh, human health and to Food security in the U.S., 100,000 premature mortalities are attributed to um, air pollution. Crop damage around the world um, is up to a, a billion dollars per year in, in crop losses. Um, and this recent report from the Health Effects Institute shows that uh, air, uh, ambient particulate matter um, is the fifth leading cause of death um, in 2015. So to predict air quality, we need to put together um, a lot of different components, and there are particular uh, difficulties in predicting air, um, locations and of rapid change. And a lot of these um, locations are areas of increasing urbanization, growing number of megacities across Asia and Africa and elsewhere. Um, the Arctic is one of the regions that's particularly um, difficult to predict due to the rapid change in climate, um, affects uh, chemistry and transport pathways, and also regions where, um, which are cleaning up their, their air pollution and, and recent uh, emission controls have been implemented, we don't completely understand how those emissions are changing. And so, that, so there are a lot of challenges in predicting air quality. So we really need to um, have coordinated research on a number of aspects that I'm gonna talk about uh, today to, to, to improve our near-term prediction of air quality on local to global scales. So we, we have some successes. We've, known, we've learned how to clean up uh, Los Angeles between 1948 and today. Um, but there, and in the 1970s, the New York was quite smoggy. But we still have a lot of difficulties because just last month, um, London had really bad smog events. And Beijing, we know, frequently has really extreme smog events. And this is a 20-minute time lapse from January of smog coming in to the 
to this camera view. So this is mostly driven by meteorology, but the original um, smog um, is from a variety of pollutants that we don't completely understand. So I'm going to talk, um, so to, to really improve our ability to, to predict air quality, we need a number of components. And these include understanding the processes of emissions, chemical processing, as tra and transport, um, connecting them with a chemistry model, generally a 3D regional or global chemistry model, and, and cross-scale observations from the surface to aircraft to satellites. And really putting all of these together is required to, um, to accurately predict air quality. So I'm going to go over some of these processes of uh, models and observations um, as a background to, to some of my work and how we combine them to improve forecasts. And then I'll get to uh, talking about the campaign we recently completed in Korea. Um, this is an example from a few years ago in Seoul of pollution also rapidly changing from uh, one day to the next, in this case, cleaning up when a front came through, um, and then close with some future research ideas. So I'm going to start by talking about processes. I'm not going to go through all of the things that we really need to understand um, in terms of processes, but I'll focus a little bit on the chemistry. Transport, we need to understand um, long-range transport, uh, boundary layer mixing, um, convection, in order to understand uh, air quality um, composition, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. And I'll also later get to a lot of the things um, we need to study in terms of emissions. So just a quick primer on tropospheric ozone photochemistry. So I'm not going to go through a lot of detail, but it's important for you to understand that um, how we produce ozone. I'm primarily going to concern and interested in studying how ozone is formed um, in the troposphere and particularly in, um, in terms of air quality. So we need um, NOx emissions, NO and NO2, as well as VOCs, which react in the presence of sunlight, producing these radicals, OH, HO2, and RO2. They're very short-lived, and we can't really measure, me measure them, but they control how quickly the hydrocarbons and VOCs, volatile organic compounds, um, are destroyed in the atmosphere, how quickly they react with um, NO and NO2, and ultimately form ozone. And so all of these uh, reactive carbon species, VOCs, um, CO, and their intermediates lead to oxygenated VOCs, OVOCs we call, and ultimately to SOA and uh, secondary organic aerosols, which can have uh, impact on air quality as well as climate. So another important component of um, my research and what I'm going to talk about later are biogenic volatile organic compounds, so we abbreviate BVOC, and these are also very important precursors for uh, ozone and SOA and um, are um, uh, emitted from vegetation, so they're very important in rural areas, but there are more and more trees within urban areas, so they're also uh, important. So the total biogenic VOC flux is about a petagram, and half of this comes from isoprene which is a hydrocarbon, a five-carbon hydrocarbon. Um, there are additional um, oxygenated and larger compounds that account for another 30%. Alpha-pinene and beta-pinene are terpenes. They're C10 compounds that I'll also mention. And then um, many other compounds that are smaller contributors. So isoprene and terpenes are emitted from trees and other vegetation, in addition to these other oxygenated species, methanol, ethanol, um, acetaldehyde, acetone. And some of these species that are directly emitted are also um, produced in photochemistry. And ultimately, they go through a, um, a variety of intermediate products, depending on how large the compound was to start with. Um, and then formaldehyde, which we can measure from space, so that's of, of particular interest, and then CO, which we also can measure from space, and is a long-lived um, compound that can be transported. So we want to put these processes into a chemistry model so that we can predict air quality on a larger scale. And 
I primarily use CAM-CHEM, the community atmosphere model with chemistry that we've um, developed here with a large, large group of people here and at, at uh, universities and national labs. And so CAM-CHEM is sort of a low atmosphere version of Wacom, which you've probably, many of you have heard of. Um, and so that we can focus on studying tropospheric chemistry with it. And we always have it coupled to the land model. We may or may not couple it to the ocean model. Um, and we've used CAMCAM for um, a lot of international model intercomparison activities, such as the Chemistry Climate Model Initiative and HTAP, uh, Hemispheric Transport of Air Pollution uh, Model Intercomparison. So, CLM also includes the Megan biogenic emissions model, which I'll get to in a minute. And so the emissions of these biogenic species are emitted um, online, are calculated online and fed to the Mozart chemistry. The atmospheric model sends back temperature and sunlight. And then there are a number of other species that we have to um, specify from emissions files, from anthropogenic emissions or fire emissions. So the chemistry that we use is from um, the, has its heritage in the model for ozone and related chemical tracers, which I started working with as soon as I, when I first started here at NCAR, we were developing Mozart I with Guy Brasseur and Didier Hoeglestein. And so there have been four versions that are a chemical transport model that are just driven by meteorology. And we're no longer developing that, but the Mozart tropospheric chemical mechanism is incorporated into CAMCHEM and also in MORPHCHEM. And we've developed this mechanism to represent global chemistry so that it can do remote regions as well as urban regions um, and, and the free troposphere. And it combines um, fairly detailed um, chemistry, but not compromises with computational um, cost. And one of our um, goals in creating this mechanism has been to include some real observed compounds so that we can directly evaluate the model with what has been observed. So we've been, over the past year or so, we've been updating the Mozart mechanism. We're calling it T1, it's the first version of the tropospheric chemistry in CESM. And I won't go through all the details, but it's, um, we're improving primarily the isoprene oxidation because we have understand from laboratory measurements and field measurements more things about how isoprene uh, gets oxidized. Um, also to improve ozone production and SOA formation. Um, so this ultimate, uh, this uh, new species has, a new mechanism has 150 gas phase species. Um, when we combine that with the upper atmosphere, middle atmosphere for, um, and modal aerosols for Wacom is um, 230 compounds, much to their dismay <laughs> at the computational cost. But we have decided that this version will be used um, for the CMIP-6 um, simulations that we're running with um, CESM. So let me go back to the Megan model. So as I said, it's coupled, it's embedded into the land model of uh, CLM and is fed by um, parameters from the atmosphere model and then it results in emissions so it includes the plant functional type and leaf area index um, in CLM so it can be evolved as climate evolves future um, vegetation map, uh, changes. And then feeds back into the atmospheric chemistry in the atmosphere model um, the emissions of isoprene and terpenes and all the other species. So Alex Gunther, so I've worked with Alex to get this running in um, CLM with version two and Alex is just finishing up a version three, and I plan to work with him to get that um, running over the next six months or so. So let me move on to observations. We have aircraft and satellite and ground-based and earth um, monitoring stations. So 
There, first, I want to say a little bit about why we do aircraft um, campaigns and what they can really help us with. So using an aircraft, we can get th a 3D picture of many trace, um, trace constituents um, over a large region, um, study their air mass evolution, how chemistry, how, the, how an air mass evolves chemistry, chemically, or, or um, uh, sorry, um, dilutes um, through the atmosphere, also provides vertical profiles so that we can get, um, validate with satellite and get a full understanding of the composition throughout the troposphere. Um, aircraft like the C-130 have a large payload, so we can put a lot of measurements on and measure a lot of compounds at one time. And then this is extremely valuable for model evaluation, to have many compounds at once. Um, we can all use the the observations to evaluate emissions, identify source contributions, and um, then also, as I said, to measure the chem chemical transformations. And then we can also use the aircraft data to evaluate and connect with ground monitoring um, or, or surface measurements. One thing, some things that aircraft measurements will not deliver are long-term monitoring because the statistics are very poor. Um, characterization of much smaller points that the aircraft can't really get to, um, and measurements very close to the ground, though the aircraft can find um, uh, airports that are not used so much and do missed approaches, and this has been um, very successful um, for getting profiles to almost the surface. So satellites and long-term ground sites and um, and fully equipped um, super sites at the surface can complement aircraft campaigns. So now just to give an example of how we put this all together in the past, we did, um, there was an international um, collection of a consortium of um, uh, field campaigns studying the Arctic in 2008 and in the spring part of this phase of these experiments there were four, four five aircraft um, flying from uh, Alaska and Canada and Greenland, um, can't see my map, um, and uh, Karuna, Sweden, and um, provided a, a large number of measurements um, across the, the Arctic. So we decided these measurements needed to be, could be exploited with a model intercomparison. So Steve Arnold and I at the University of Leeds um, coordinated this intercomparison with eight global models and two regional smaller scale models using the same emissions for the same time period and um, hope to, to really make some under, develop some understanding of what, what the limitations in the models and the emissions were um, during, this, during this period. So there are a number of ground sites in the, in the Arctic. Barrow um, has multiple, um, has had many uh, year-round measurements for many years. And so we extracted the model results for these um, locations. This is CO at the top and ozone at the bottom. And there's some consistency among the models to show that um, we get sort of the seasonal cycle, but a consistent underestimate in the winter, but the ozone uh, from the models is quite variable. And similarly, we compared all of the models to the aircraft measurements. This is from several days of the NASA DC-8 um, profiles um, over the near, near Alaska and northward. So the models all consistently underestimate carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons. So that's a good indication that the emissions are too low. However, um, the models also give very different results for things like PAN, which is a, um, a combination of VOCs and, and nitrogen, peroxyacetyl nitrate, and an indication that all the models have very different chemistry. So there's a lot of work still to do to understand why these models produce so much, um, have so many differences in the secondary products. And another um, tool we used in this model into comparison was to tag sources from different regions and to look at how these different regions contributed to pollution and the composition in the Arctic. So we had three tags from each continent, 
And this is a zonal average of this tracer from Asia. So the, the emissions are bet primarily between 20 and 40 degrees south. So there was a fair amount of convection, whereas pollution from Europe stays um, at lower altitudes on its transport to the Arctic. Um, so we can see that it gets lofted, but it also a significant amount reaches um, the Arctic from Asia. And this is a summary of all of these different regions. The blue is anthropogenic emissions and red and yellow from fires. If you focus on the, the black and the red, these are both from Asia, and they're some of the most significant um, sources in, uh, to the Arctic, um, particularly in the mid-troposphere. So Asia is very uh, interesting. We know from a variety of um, evidence from, from various measurements, and measurements in the Arctic make it very difficult to understand what is really happening there. So we need to go look in Asia a little more carefully to understand those sources. So this is a summary. We've, uh, there have been many plots like this over recent years, summarizing NO2 column from satellite measurements, GOM and then Skiamaki, um, averaged over different regions. And East China is a dramatic uh, has been dramatically increasing over the past decade or so. And whereas regions that have implemented emissions controls, such as Europe and Asia, have been decreasing, um, have been decreasing. So we also have a lot of ground measurements in East Asia, in particular in Seoul, there's been um, a decrease in CO and SO2 and particulate matter as they've implemented uh, emission controls for them. But ozone and NO2 have continued to rise. And um, the Koreans were rather puzzled by this and have um, solicited our input. So a number of years ago, um, Alex Gunther, Seon Kim, and I uh, started talking to them about um, doing a study in Korea to, to understand this contribution. So it seemed likely it could be from uh, upwind from China, but there are also complicated sources within Korea. Seoul, for example, is a megacity of 25 million inhabitants, and half of Korea's population lives in Seoul. So outside of this, the city and the metropolitan area, the peninsula is primarily forested. And so there are very large isoprene and terpene emissions um, throughout the peninsula. There are a few isolated um, additional cities along the south coast and through the, through the peninsula. So um, this makes this a, a very interesting location where we could look at urban and rural emissions um, quite separately. So a few years ago, Alex, Eric, Seon Kim, and I proposed um, to NSF to take the C-130 for a proposal come, uh, project called Gambai, Gases and Aerosols in Megacity Biosphere-Atmosphere Interactions. Gambai means cheers in, or something like it, in Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. So we thought it was a very appropriate name for the region. The Koreans weren't so sure that that was an appropriate name for scientific experiment, but we really liked it. But um, NSF didn't really like the experiment, so um, gone by is on the back burner. Um, but I talked to Jim Crawford at NASA and persuaded him that going to Korea would be an excellent thing. And he said, yeah, I like Korean barbecue. Um, but also agreed that this was a very good time for NASA to return to Korea. They did. Uh, sort of similar experiment called Trace P in 2001, but it had been a long time since NASA had studied um, air quality in Asia. So we developed, I, I joined the, the leadership team with Jim Crawford and um, JL Sadi and a number of Korean collaborators to design this experiment called Chorus AQ, which is Korea US air quality study. Um, and we ended up with three aircraft, the NASA DC-8, the uh, NASA Langley King Air, and the Koreans have a King Air that they've been using for a number of years but are not particularly experienced in making aircraft measurements. So it was an opportunity to um, help, help teach them 
um, better techniques for aircraft measurements. So this was at the start of ex the experiment. So everybody who was there then is in this photo. And so the campaign was from May to mid-June this past year, 2016. We were based at Osan Air Base, which is directly south of Seoul. Um, and there's lots of information on, on NASA's websites about the campaign. So a little bit more, so we also connected these three aircraft with a number of major uh, ground sites. Um, an island off the coast of North Korea up here, it's actually South Korean, but it was a very good uh, upwind site, several sites within Korea, uh, with, around Seoul, um, and spread out around the island, and one on Jeju Island, which has been a long-term measurement site for um, a lot of different compounds, which is, provides another um, remote upwind sort of site. There were also uh, a couple of ships to make measurements out along the coast. And we connected with the uh, GOSI satellite image uh, instrument, is a geostationary ocean college color imager that also gets aer uh, at aerosol optical depth, uh, is sitting over East Asia. And there was a large group of um, modeling groups involved in, uh, in helping with model forecasts, and we'll be working on the analysis of these observations. So the three aircraft had very different roles. The NASA DC-8 is very large. For those of you who haven't seen it, this is the inside. You can't see so well. But it's um, many, many racks. It's an indication of all the inlets on one side of the plane. So it had trace gases and numerous uh, aerosol composition and property measurements. It also has a LIDAR, so that when we flew high, we could look down and get a full curtain of the um, ozone and uh, aerosol backscattering. Uh, we had antennic flux, and it can fly for eight hours and profiles from the surface to about eight kilometers for this. It can go a bit higher. The NASA Langley King Air had a um, couple of remote sensors, so it just stayed flying high and sort of simulated a, um, a satellite. So Geotasso is a copy of the Tempo instrument that will be launched in a couple of years. Uh, MOS provides ocean color similar to the GOSI instrument that's currently flying. So it stayed up high at eight kilometers and tried to stay out of air traffic. Um, and the, King, the Koreans King Air from Hanseo University had a small payload with just a few in situ um, measurements of a key, key species. And it primarily stayed at low altitude and being small could maneuver to, um, to, to, to sample surface sites better. So a lot of the motivation for uh, the campaign is to, to learn what will geostationary satellites um, that are, uh, will be launched uh, in a constellation in a few years. Tempo will be over the US, uh, Sentinel-4 over Europe, and the GEMS instrument uh, satellite flying over East Asia, launched by the Koreans. And all of these will measure instruments, uh, compounds uh, NO2 and ozone. Um, so this is as a collecting all of this data, along with the um, Geotasso instrument, will help prepare us to um, have retrieval algorithms ready for that. So this is a, a sample flight track, a typical track that the uh, NASA King Air flew um, over Seoul. So this is the main part of Seoul, the Han River flying through here, uh, flowing through here. Um, there was a ground site here, a ground site, uh, two Pandora instruments which measure, measure NO2 columns from the ground. Um, another ground site here. So they mapped out this track four times a day. It took a couple hours to do each track. They'd land, refuel, and um, go back and do it again. And so we have some preliminary data. So early in the morning, NO2 concentrations are fairly low, but the urban areas show up. Eight to 10, or uh, this is 10 to 12. Um, it's clear to see the um, urban regions and the highway, main high, north-south highway from Seoul um, as, as traffic increased, and, but the boundary layer stayed still somewhat um, shallow to, to concentrate the, the emissions. 
Later in the afternoon, the boundary layer increases, and so concentrations can decrease. Sun sunlight um, affects the chemistry, uh, but still there's a very large amount in one of the, in the central urban, urban area. And then in the afternoon, um, drops off again. So these are the flight tracks um, for all of the, the three airplanes for the entire campaign. So the NASA DC-8 flew 20 flights, um, but they're all on top of each other. And this is due to our um, restricted airspace. Most of the country is covered with uh, military regions that are used for training, at least during the week. And so we were restricted to flying along the commercial corridors from Seoul, between Seoul and the other major cities, as well as along the west, um, western edge beyond these um, military zones, but inside um, Korean airspace. Uh, this is the Chinese border. So we had a number of uh, flights out here along the West Sea and across the peninsula. On the weekend, we were allowed access to some of these military place um, regions and, and could do some other things. And the, NASA, uh, the Korean King Air um, started out just flying this box. This sort of the, I think the air traffic control had said, well, yeah, you could do this. And so they, they just settled for that and thought, well, that'll give them inflow and some other things. But after they watched the DC-8 doing all sorts of crazy maneuvers and asking for more permission, um, they, they got much more adventurous and they were flying around the power plants and um, cities on the south coast and were flying in Seoul and doing all sorts of great things. So I think that was one of the great um, uh, successes of this uh, campaign was, was showing them what is capable, what, what aircraft ought to be um, used for and how they could get more out of it. So the NASA DC-8 set up a pattern where we flew through Seoul two or three times a day. And so Osan Air Base is off the south here. And so we'd start every flight with this pass through um, over Seoul and over, um, we do a missed approach at the Seoul Air Base and then fly, stay low and fly over the Tewa Forest site, which is as a tower in the middle of the forest just outside of the city um, with a large number of instruments, instruments brought from um, the US as well as a lot of Korean measurements and uh, ozone sondes were launched here. NASA took a ozone LIDAR, has continuous uh, ozone profiles there, as well as a lot of in-situ measurements of um, other ozone precursors and VOCs. And then we do a spiral um, up to eight kilometers or so and then go off and do whatever our flight was. And then we come back and we had permission to do a spiral in this spot at noon and then at 3.30 in the afternoon. So this provided excellent sampling. And we first asked for permission to do this missed approach. We didn't really know how they would direct us. So the very first flight, they went up and they crossed the, they headed north and we had been told they will not be able to cross the Han River. Um, the president's house is in the center of Seoul and there's just the Gimpo Airport, it's just too busy. So the pilots were all, weren't sure what they were gonna to be told to do and air traffic control said, yeah, yeah, up here, up here. You know, North Korea's right here. So everybody was like, well, I don't know. And then they came, turned around, did the missed approach. And after that, Jim Crawford said, okay, do that every single time. And so they did, they, we got permission and this was the, the standard, standard route. So we have excellent statistics from that. I will show some data for that in just a minute. So this is the view from doing this missed approach. Um, the company Lotte has built this 555 meter tall tower, which you think you could never miss, and the plane flew pretty close, but there were some days where the pilots were wondering, okay, do we see the tower yet? Where exactly are we? So um, there were some pretty smoggy days. And this is the ground site um, right called at Olympic Park, which is the site of the Seoul Olympics. Um, and there were ground measurements made right in this park, um, which is right at the edge of the city. So there was another big um, collection of, of measurements there. 
So my role in this uh, campaign was to help with the flight planning and every morning we'd get up early and decide on where the plane should fly. We didn't have a lot of choices, but we had some choices, so we had to um, figure out where um, pollution was flowing and where could we best sample it. Um, so there were a large number group of models, um, particularly even just from NCAR. Um, Gabby Pfister and Arthur Mitzi set up running WARF with NO2 tracers, which is this. Um, so we based um, some synthetic tracers with just a two-day lifetime based on NOx emissions from, this is from point sources, um, such as power plants. We also had a tracer from area and mobile sources, so traffic and, and um, other residential heating or something sort of sources. Um, and this shows just in three days that the airflow um, is quite variable, that sometimes these plumes flow across the peninsula and sometimes they flow out to sea. So we also had Pablo Said had ran Warp Chem with full chemistry. Um, Jerome Barre and Ben Gobert set up Cam Chem with a simulation of MOP at CO using DART. Uh, Christoph Knote, who used to be a postdoc here, ran FlexPart. We had real time Moppet and Yazi retrievals, and we had real time fin fire emissions. So there were other groups from the US. Um, NASA ran, NASA Goddard ran GS5 with tracers. They now are running GS5 um, for the analysis with GS chem chemistry at 12 and a half kilometer horizontal resolution for the globe. A little bit envious, but um, we, we just haven't seen those results yet. And then there were numerous um, global and regional modeling groups from Korea who had a lot of local experience and been um, looking at running air quality models um, in Korea for a long time. So they're quite, that was um, quite useful to include them. So for example, on, uh, for one of these days, we looked at deciding how to, um, for, for a flight plan, there was um, emission coming, there were pollution coming from China. We had a tracer of CO from North China, primarily uh, Beijing and, and regions. So this strong plume was just reaching Korea over the West Sea. It looked like maybe not the strongest pollution would be over the peninsula, but we um, would be favorable to fly in, over the West Sea to get the large, large plume. And by mid-May, mid -may, temperatures were warming up and we had more biogenic emissions, so isoprene um, was quite a bit higher than it had been. And then the point sources, there were strong northerly winds over Korea, and so these point sources off the um, south coast um, were flowing southward over the ocean where we could sample them more easily. We had, we had access, more access here than we would have had um, looking at them over the peninsula. And also, they're um, less affected by other sources so that we could hopefully get a better picture of what um, were just the, was just the pollution from those point sources. So this was the flight plan we came up with. We started naming them all. This one was called bibimbap, which is a Korean dish of lots of vegetables, because this had some of everything. So we went over the West Sea, measured Chinese pollution, um, sampled Seoul, we measured isoprene, and we measured point sources. And we also connected to one of the ships, so this extra little circles down here at the end of the flight where the plane flew around the ship a couple of times. And so each flight, each, each of these legs, we would start out and do a high altitude leg and look at what the um, dial LIDAR showed us. And we'd get a picture in real time of what, um, um, of the concentration. So this is ozone. And we could see that we got the high layer, high, high ozone amounts very close to the surface. And so then that would help us decide which altitude to fly when we flew back. And so usually we'd fly as low as we could um, and then pick some other altitude that we thought would fly through the maximum of that. So the results from the campaign are super very preliminary. It was just finished last June. Um, preliminary data was only just due in 
January. Final data will be due in July. But people are still working very, are already working very hard to finish their data and understand it. Um, and the Koreans are very interested in understanding these results to figure out what they might do to, um, to, to improve their air quality. So they're requesting a rapid science synthesis report uh, in June. And we had a science team meeting last week. Uh, this isn't the photo from this. This is from the end of the mission, but we took a photo. Many of these people were in Korea last week um, to discuss these uh, first results and see what it is that we might be able to tell uh, the Korean government um, about our findings. So they're particularly interested in understanding um, the, the sources uh, near Seoul, traffic versus power plants, um, as well as um, further quantifying the chemistry that's driving ozone and aerosol formation. So our models can quantify these different source contributions by tagging different, um, different emissions sectors and by, and by region. But we first need to see if they actually reproduce um, the results. Another um, set of data that we um, can look at immediately were some, the real-time air quality monitors that we, and we downloaded preliminary data during the campaign to, to look at. Um, so this is PM and ozone on the bottom. And so this is from a collection of sites near Seoul, but also a number of other cities um, around the peninsula. And the uh, points, colored in orange are the days that the airplane flew, the net, DC-8 in particular. And the blue um, points were other days. And the Korean air quality standard is shown as a red line here. So for particulate matter, we showed uh, that during the time of the campaign, there were particularly high episodes in, uh, at the end of May. And for ozone, there was a very long um, period when we were excessively high um, from mid-May to towards the end of the campaign. But on most days, some of these monitors exceeded the eight-hour average for, um, for ozone. So there are certainly um, a number of considerations, uh, problems that, of air quality that they need to address. So the, the orange points show that the DC-8 sampled a good um, consistent um, sampling of the, of the conditions during this campaign. So now I'm going to go back and show these results from the DC-8 during Oversoul. Um, so we looked at all of these um, profiles from below two kilometers over Seoul when the plane flew through th two or three times a day, um, sorted by daytime. This is Knox, so the midday. Uh, shows the highest NOx levels. And these are two different collections of models compared to these observations. The models are in colored lines. And in both cases, the models are much too low. And so we think this is really due to um, the emissions. And because it's in the middle of Seoul, it's probably due to the traffic, but um, an underestimation of the traffic emissions But we in the inventories. But we're still working on sorting that out. Exactly. And we also put in an, our global CAM CAM model, a tracer for um, CO from Asia, from three regions of China. And so this is the total CO from the model and the observations in black points, the models in red crosses. And this is the fraction of these tag CO to the total CO. And so this shows that 60% of the CO seen in Seoul on this one day um, just over Seoul is coming from China. However, there are also days when conditions are quite stagnant. This was a day when there was particularly strong flow directly from China. But when it's stagnant, um, the um, amounts of CO are less. You know, it's only 200 to 400 ppb, which is huge compared to what we see in the US, um, as opposed to 600. And it's a 20% um, contribution from China. But so we still have to fully understand, evaluate the model, make sure we get um, proper emissions. But there are certainly times when Korea was mostly influenced by Korean emissions. 
And another thing that we'll be looking at is how um, biogenic emissions impacted the, the composition um, in Seoul and um, around Korea. In mid-May, temperatures started increasing on the bottom here, and so the isoprene um, emissions shot up. And so by the end of the campaign, at least this middle part of the campaign, we have a significant influence of biogenics so that we can look at the interaction of the urban and, and biogenic pollution and see their impact on ozone and SOA. Anthropogenic VOCs are also extremely important. Um, these pink dots show the point sources throughout um, the country. There's some really big chemical plants near Seoul, um, but th I think there are a lot of other sources as well. And we looked at toluene. These are measurements from the PTRMS. And the models grossly underestimate that. So they saw toluene not, the, the plane sampled it all over um, Seoul, not just, or all over Korea, not just near these, these chemical plants. So that will be an important thing to fix in the emissions inventory, because that toluene can lead to a, a very fast ozone production and is also an important SOA precursor. And we looked, we've looked briefly at ozone, and the models underestimate ozone, particularly in the lower troposphere. The black dots are the observations. These colors are a couple models. And that's not surprising due to NOx being too low. Um, the NOx emissions are increased, as well as the VOC increase, increased. Um, we should be able to get reproduce the ozone amounts. Also wanted to point out that in the pre troposphere, ozone never drops below. 60 ppb. So if there is pollution coming from China, that's from the free troposphere and probably not from, um, oh, this is probably not from Korea, but transported from the region. So they're already starting with 60 ppb of ozone in the region that can get mixed down into um, the Seoul area. So they have um, a lot of, they'll have a lot of difficulty yeah, in really improving. Yes, of course. Um, often the models are um, very close to ozone. We change all sorts of things. So this, um, the, the model results are also preliminary as the observations, but um, to have a 20 or 30 PVB difference in ozone is, is significant out of 80. So one of the problems that uh, the Koreans will have is um, in, in controlling their air quality is that ozone production is not linear. So the conditions that have been seen in um, Seoul, the observations indicate um, on this chart, um, Seoul is in this range. So this is NOx versus a measure of hydrocarbons. It's reactivity. It's how quickly VOCs react with OH. Um, and the colored contours are the production rate of ozone. So in this range, um, we're typically at a, I don't know what these numbers are, 30 ppb per hour. Um, and the age, the, the composition, uh, the measurements in what's considered an age sole plume outside the city um, are down here. So you can see that these um, isoplasts of ozone production go this way and that the age sold plume probably has faster ozone production than even in the city, perhaps due to the uh, increase of biogenic emissions. So if the Koreans were to um, only improve, reduce their NOx emissions without changing VOC, they would be increasing ozone production rates until they get to very low NOx levels. So in order to make um, progress, or even stay, uh, start approaching cleaner air quality, they're going to have to control NOx and VOCs, um, which would even just maintain their, their high values of ozone. So the, there's, there's some significant challenges um, ahead. So just in summary, um, uh, the course AQ um, data and observations and modeling associated will provide um, a wide range of pollution conditions for testing air quality prediction. And we have a lot of work still to do to 
to um, uh, evaluate emissions inventories and, and study how well the models are representing the chemistry. Um, and, and we hope that these results will be able, applicable to many other cities uh, around the world. And so really I wanted to emphasize that I've tried to show that improvement of air quality requires connecting measurements and models and understanding the, the chemical processes. And as we move forward, we have a, um, we can continue to the, use this framework of connecting processes and models and observations, but coming up we will have um, the, a stretched grid sort of model that combines um, a fine scale resolution in a global model, either with MPAS or CESM um, spectral element model, which will be a really exciting um, step forward in, in improving our air quality uh, predictions. And we connect the results from these model simulations, go into forecasts, observing system uh, experiments that help define where measurements are needed, and then we can define new observations, where new observations are needed, and, and define field campaigns that will give us more observations to further test our uh, process models. And the analyses and forecasts from these models are applicable to, to the larger community. Um, for operational forecasts, we can um, perhaps health alerts, um, not work that we will do, but we can connect with partners that our research um, in developing these tools will, will aid those. And all of this work um, connects with other labs in NCAR, CGD and M cubed, um, EOL for the observations. And so one of the things, one campaign I just want to close with that we're thinking about, um, that we've started defining, is to look in a very kind of different regime from Korea, where we were looking at urban emissions influencing, uh, interacting with emissions from the forest. In um, Southeast Australia, there are very high biogenic emissions in a global isoprene map. Um, uh, Australia, Southeast Australia is a real hot spot. And these biogenic emissions are upwind of um, Sydney. So Sydney residents are very concerned about how, how much influence that has on their air quality. So the eucalyptus forests are, are not very well measured um, in terms of isoprene and terpene emissions. And um, Sydney is a growing city that, that with a lot of NOx. So there's a lot of uh, to be studied um, to understand the ozone and, and aerosol production from, from this regime. So we're still in the planning stages for that. Um, so thank you, and acknowledgments to Chorus AQ and NASA for my funding. Thanks. Louisa, we have time for a few questions. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, since I don't think the Koreans want to cut down all their trees, uh, do you know what proportion of VOCs are biogenic versus anthropogenic? Um, no, we don't know that yet, but I think that will, um, yeah, no, they're, they're very protective of their trees. I don't know how they will be cutting them down. Um, but they can probably, if, we, we have no idea where this um, anthropogenic toluene is coming from, but if we can figure that out, I could imagine that would help a lot. Uh, thanks, Lisa. That's a great talk. Um, the, uh, you said the part of the flight planning was looking to see where the pollution was and going out and flying through it. Do you, do you worry about somebody making sort of a campaign average map of pollution and saying, wow, there was pollution everywhere all the time? Like, um, well, or, I think that was you, the case. But um, it, <laughs> I mean, you didn't go fly the clean areas in a representative manner, or is that not an issue when you're doing, when you just do like interpolating no, well, the models it, to the flights themselves? Um, Every, every flight was different, and as you could see from the you know, Knox Tracer movie, the, the flow was m far more variable, I think, than we really anticipated. Um, so I think it will really require looking at each day um, separately to, to, to make quantitative in, um, assessments of the, of the emissions. Um, 
I think, yes, a, a campaign average map would say there's pollution everywhere, but whether it's Korea versus China will really require looking at the specific meteorology for each day. Because there were periods of, of stagnant, but there were a lot of fronts. The first part of the campaign, there were fronts coming through and would clean things out and um, or bring in strong pollution from China and then clean it out, and then the pollution would build up that was primarily local. So it's pretty interesting, but it, it is complicated. Um, Laura had her hand. Hey, Louisa. Um, I'm very interested in this uh, ozone pollution versus aerosol pollution. So when you went out there, uh, what's the expectation or how common it is that uh, ozone pollution so much more outweigh the aerosol pollution? And uh, what that tells the local people in terms of their emission control? Um, so. I'm, I'm, I don't think that's the case. I don't think ozone outweighed um, aerosol. Ozone was is what I was um, am interested in looking at, and aerosol pollution has been studied extensively, and the Koreans are very interested in it, and so I think that's and you can see it. So everybody pays most attention to that. And when we first got there, the Koreans were always talking about dust from China and PM10, and. Um, I think they wanted to say, well, it's dust from China. We can't do anything. But um, we, you know, after a short time, we said, well, PM 2.5 is what you should really care about. And that, that comes locally. So I think they're both easy, um, equally important. And ozone production has not been studied as well. It's more complicated because there are a lot of things that go into it. Jeff. Yes, over Korea, can you say whether or not uh, the presence or absence of clouds is a factor in the pollution? Um, I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not sure a factor in the pollution. It was certainly a factor during the campaign because the remote sensor needed, needed clear conditions. Um, and so we were paying a lot of attention to when the clouds were. There were certainly... Um, there were a couple of cases we flew through a frontal system, and there was certainly pollution embedded in these cloudy frontal systems. Um, so they're, they're, in a lot of times, closely connected. For example, if, you do, if someone were to do another study in Korea, would measuring clouds be uh, um, an important part of that? Or is it really not a, not an important factor in studying pollution in in that region? No, I think I think far more um, important is understanding what the local sources are and and the the gas and aerosol phase chemistry and transport. I'm not uh, behind you. Yeah, thank you, Louisa. Very interesting uh, seminar. Uh, I've talked to my. Uh, to, uh, Japanese colleagues, and they've done studies in Tokyo looking at a different aspect of megacities, that is heat stress. And as you get warmer, they want to plant more trees. Well, if you plant more trees, you're going to have more emissions. And in a future climate, it may even get worse because you get even more emissions. Have you looked into this type of interaction in your CMIP 5 or 6 type of uh, simulations? Um, no, not yet, but I agree. That's a, that's a very important consideration, and, and people are thinking about that. We don't, that is something that needs to go into um, future scenarios. Um, on a global scale, it, it's been hard to put in our model, but um, certainly having more trees, emitting more VOCs will um, affect. I mean, the air these, these are serious considerations in Japan because they're getting so hot in the summertime in megacities. There's already a heat island effect, and so they're trying to use that to right. mitigate the sensible heat. Right. Right. Yeah. No, that's um, definitely interesting, an added, interesting added complication. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? All right, let's thank Louisa once again. Thanks. <laughs>